Thank you for joining me on another episode of Quite Franklin. Today on my show is Mick West. He runs website called metabunk.org. Now, metabunk.org is a website that is designed at debunking a lot of common conspiracy theories, things like UFOs, 9-11, chemtrails. He's also the author of Escaping the Rabbit Hole, How to Debunk Conspiracy Theories Using Facts, Logic, and Respect. Today, Mick and I get into some discussions. We'll touch on chemtrails a little bit, a little bit on 9-11 conspiracy theories, a little bit on UFOs, uh, and we just bounce all over the place. We get his thoughts on how to debunk these theories, why they do not have any kind of validity. And uh, we just, I guess we go down the rabbit hole. Quite frankly, it's kind of unusual. It's quite, quite Franklin. Quite fr- <laughs> Got it. Quite Franklin. I read an article that you are a, a self-proclaimed psychic. <laughs> so I was, on. I was. Uh... Okay, <laughs> hold on. I'm going to put your powers to the test. What is the first question tonight I'm going to ask you? Um, You are going to ask me, what was it like making Tony Hawk's Pro Skater? No, actually, the first question I was going to ask you is how (laughs) you were doing. You failed at this miserably. That's a back in time, back in time uh, psychic. (laughs) (laughs) The opposite of what uh, I thought I could do. Hold on. How old were you in 81 when you you were interested in programming this computer? Uh, That would have been about 14, I think. Okay, yeah. Because I figured you weren't weren't that many years older than me. And so um, it's a... Yeah, that's a young age to to really decide like, hey, I want to program this computer. What what, wow, what gave you the interest in that? Uh, it was kind of like my my, my grandfather was uh, was big into programming at the time. He was taking open university courses, which is like the free courses you can do over the TV in in the England back in the back in the eighties. Yeah, and uh, he had brought me a programmable calculator, which I think had about uh, thirty two bytes of memory. I mean, literally thirty two bytes. Yeah, and uh, I I. I played around on that and learned to program on that. And then uh, he encouraged me to buy a computer and I saved up and bought one. It's, so it's just, you know, I was into math and stuff like that uh, when I was younger and uh, science to a degree. And it just seemed like the most amazing thing that you could actually type things in and on your TV and something would pop up on the TV. Yeah. That's how you use computers back then. You, you hook them up to the TV, like yep. the old ones, like the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. Yeah, I can remember. It's attached to the TV. The idea of a monitor was a, a luxury that we could not imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's funny when you talk about uh, 32 bits of memory. I think, I don't know, I can't remember. Maybe it was like Steve Jobs at one point in time that said something like, I, I don't know why you would ever need more than like eight megabytes of memory for a computer or something. It was uh, Bill Gates. Oh, Gates. He was, he was saying he didn't know where you'd need more than one megabyte. I think at the time, the 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 IBM compatible computers that the Microsoft Windows ran on came with a maximum, I think, of 640 kilobytes, uh, which was you know a ridiculously small amount of memory. It's about the amount of memory that it would take to uh, perhaps cover my eyeball in this image, yeah, in terms of the, the the image density or like a little bit of my face. But you know, it was it's hardly anything. I might get I might get a little bit of your know. iris along with the pupil with that with the uh, <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's not not enough. Like if you if you open a Word document now, and it probably comes in at uh, like like forty k or something like that, just for a blank document. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. It's it's funny how things change and our expectations uh, change over time. Like we really had no idea, and and he, even though he was like right in the middle of things, he had no idea how much things would progress uh, over time. Like the amount of computing power in an iPhone or any any phone now is just vastly outstrips. Uh, even the mainframe computers of that time. So, so you were you were you were programming. I liked uh, I liked the comment you made about actually uh, leaving programming. Um, talking about how you just didn't like uh, you didn't you didn't like being in a job where you were being told what to do. In essence, like yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like I was uh, I don't know uh, uh, a guard in a prison camp being told what to do. I was. Uh, <laughs> it was just it was a bit. It was getting a bit repetitive. Uh, I I enjoyed it and I enjoyed working with people there at at Neversoft, but I kind of felt like I wanted to do something different and I was just doing the same thing year after year. Uh, So I I left thinking that I might start my own company and do some kind of, uh, some, some kind of software thinking about doing AI or something. But one thing I discovered after I left is that having the structure of uh, working at a job for me was a good motivator to actually getting things done. So, uh, 
Uh, I didn't end up starting a software company, I think partly because I, I didn't have any of the structure around me to do it. And I just kind of drifted for a while doing various different things, learning to fly and uh, writing uh, various things. I worked at a game, develop a game development magazine, uh, writing a, a column for a while, uh, did some freelance stuff, and then kind of ended up doing this kind of uh, writing about uh, science and conspiracies thing, uh, more or less uh, is my main thing now. When you started doing that, did you set like, did you set that up as if it were a job so that you had the same structure or was it just kind of a hobby and you just kind of part of the float and then you, your float almost like a hot air balloon said, we're just going to land here on this thing? Yeah, well, you know, I probably should have done. <laughs> you know, there's the, the famous <laughs> Pink Floyd song, uh, Time, Yeah, uh, which is, uh, you know, ticking away the moments that make up a dull day, a dull day. And one of my favorite lines in that is, uh, then one day you find 10 years, you look behind, no one told you when to run, you miss the starting gun. And it's so easy to look back 10 years and think, you know, what did I not do in those last 10 years? And what could I have done? And I think if, if I'd started doing, I don't know, iPhone app development uh, uh, 10 years ago and uh, worked at that, I'd, have, I'd, be, I'd, having a, I'd be having a big iPhone app company. Or if I'd started my writing in more earnest 10 years ago, I would have done better. So, you know, it, it would have been good had I uh, imposed more structure upon myself from the start, but, but I didn't. And, uh, and here I am. You know, I often say, people ask me what I want in life. And I always say like, I want freedom. You know, if you, you, you I'll ask people the question, like if, if you won the lottery and you won, like you had more money than God type of money type, like what would your life look like tomorrow? And I know exactly what my life would look like tomorrow. I, I wouldn't necessarily work a full-time job. And I know this, uh, because I wouldn't need to, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't have purpose or that I wouldn't be driven. Uh, but it's like, you know, how would you, yeah. I'll ask you that question. If you won that lottery, more money than God type of lottery, what, what would, how would your life look different tomorrow than it is today? Well, it would be, it would be looking for a different house, I think, but it wouldn't look hugely <laughs> different. Exactly. So I, I kind of did win the lottery a little bit with, with the Tony Hawk game. And, uh, when we sold the company to Activision, I, I made enough money to, to retire on. Uh, not super rich, but you know, a, a comfortable enough retirement. So I've got yeah. a nice little house here in uh, in Sacramento, uh, and I think if if I won vastly more money, I would just probably just do a little bit more of the type of things I did now, and perhaps a bit of a more luxurious way, like traveling yeah. uh, and uh, you know having a having a house and uh, and doing things with my my friends and family. Yeah. So uh, I don't think it would be hugely different. And, you know, you, you look at people who win, who did win the lottery, a lot of them don't do very well. No. Uh, so they don't, they don't have that experience of, uh, of dealing with, with money. You go from one thing to another. And, you know, I've, I've been lucky, I think, in that I've managed to effectively transition uh, to my, my life of leisure mm -hmm. uh, without uh, becoming a crazy person. Uh, a lot of people don't. And uh, it's, I think it's, it's difficult for a lot of people to uh, to deal with such a significant change of their of their lives because a lot of people's lives are really tied up in their work, and that defines them and makes them who they are. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, it's the same with me. I my, I don't think my life would change very much. Like you, I would probably you know, have the luxury of traveling. You know, I could maybe fly private instead of yeah. uh, commercial and I wouldn't have to deal with the airport, something like that. But overall my life would, would be the same because at the end of the day, I like hanging out with, with my family and not all of them are wealthy. And, I, and it, you know, it's like mm -hmm. even the more money you make in life, I find that I enjoy the simple things that I grew up with, like having bonfires at my house and roasting yeah, yeah, marshmallows definitely. and, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Like you, it, you can't, like, you can't take that out of you. It's, uh, I, I, I couldn't, I, I thought about myself like being, for example, like part of the Royal family and having to go to these <laughs> formal events and dress up all the time. And I mean, God, yeah. if I had to put a tie on every day, even if it was for fun, that's not fun to me. And Yes, so I'm not, a, not a not a formal dresser. I'm a t-shirt guy. I always have been. My my very first day of work when I got a job after I left university, I I had no idea. You know, I was like 21 when I got my first job, uh, and I thought that if you had a job, you had to wear a suit and tie. 
So I, I, I went to the interview and got the, got the job. And then I, I turned up at this small game developer and I was carrying a briefcase and I had this almost like a pinstripe suit and tie and everybody else was just there in like jeans and t-shirts and like, it looked, it looked like they've just come out of a rock concert or something. <laughs> so I got very embarrassed and sat there for, for the day. Then the next day I came back in more appropriate attire. <laughs> No one said anything. <laughs> you could have been that guy that just showed up in bow ties and in uh, three piece suits every day, yeah, type of thing. Yeah, and yeah, I've seen, I've seen those guys. <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been your angle, but, I guess. But that wasn't me. That wasn't me. I'm a, I'm a casual dude. So, with the w- your website now that you run, do you, are, is is that just you, or do you have an office and an, an entire team? Because no, you know, no, this is. It's just, just my office. Th- that is your office. Okay. <laughs> I was is. on Metabunk and you do all the posting yourself and everything for the most part. I mean, you, do you have contributors or there's just other people that come in on the, the forums? And- well, it's essentially a forum. So anyone can, can post, but you know, not, not everyone's got the time to do detailed articles on, on things. So the bigger posts tend to be me. Yeah. But the, there, are, there are quite a few threads on there that other people have started and quite a few quite detailed ones as well. And I, I sometimes like feature those as well on the front page. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's mostly me. So it's kind of like, you know, the Midwest blog in a way or the Midwest news outlet or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's it's it, it grew out of my, my earlier blog, uh, which was focused entirely on the chemtrails conspiracy theory called contrail science Mm -hmm. and it was really just because i i wanted you know just a broader um you know forum to to talk about all kinds of different things and uh, that's where metabunk came from so i'll ask you this question then are there any conspiracy theories that you do believe in well yeah there are because conspiracy theories kind of exist on a sliding scale yeah sliding but a scale so there's there's obviously lots of very mundane conspiracy theories that or conspiracies that have happened uh, because we know that the government conspires to do things, like you know, historically it's certainly done things. Uh, you look at, say, uh, for example, the rationale for uh, the the Vietnam War, which was partly based on this incident called the Gulf of Tonkin. Yeah, you were talking uh, about where, this in your book, actually. Yeah, yeah, it was supposedly a attack by uh, North Vietnam or well, Vietnam uh, on. Uh, well, yeah, I guess it's North Vietnam. Yeah, North Vietnam uh, on a boat, so an American battleship. And uh, they thought that this was an act of aggression by North Vietnam. And they used that to pass the, uh, I think it was called the Vietnam War Act. And then they basically started bombing North Vietnam. And that was the start of the war. Uh, but really, the the event didn't really happen. It, it, was, it was kind of like an accidental uh, identification where they thought that the ship was being attacked and it wasn't but the conspiracy there was basically the the secretary of state robert mcnamara didn't tell the president in time and he kind of delayed things and uh, by the time it all got out there there was there was it was the die was uh, was cast and there was no going back uh, so there was a little bit of conspiracy to try to start the war so things like that happen but you know, do does that then necessarily follow that the moon landings never happened and the government is spraying us with contrails and the, and that uh, the 9/11 was an inside job and uh, JFK was assassinated by the CIA like there's all these different conspiracies and some of them are super extreme some are really bizarre and some of them are kind of believable like JFK being assassinated you know you could believe that somebody uh, other than uh, leave how leave how Oswald was involved in that that's a you know plausible thing uh, but you know things that I personally believe. You know, I, I believe that there is uh, collusion going on between people in industry and people in government to try to change regulations and laws to to increase the profits of large corporations and uh, and, and then an individual basis for individuals to to get. Um, I don't know, get elected or, or get money and get campaign contributions. Things like that obviously happen because that's just simple, banal uh, corruption and conspiracy that's gone on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. I mean, obviously there's a distrust. I always, I always tell people like, I'm, like I'm a skeptic. I really liked, enjoyed reading your book, uh, Escaping the Rabbit Hole, um, a lot. And I do entertain a lot of conversations on conspiracy theories. I, I like listen. I even like listening to flat earthers, you know, moon, moon landers, all that kind of stuff. And I and I like that. I like kind of trying to think outside the box. I like putting myself in a position where I'm like, okay, let me just 
try to assume for a moment that the earth really is flat and like see this argument from the other side. I was, um, you know, there was a time when, uh, I was, I, there's, um, in Cincinnati, outside the Cincinnati area, there's, um, um, a creation museum. It's, a uh, you know, about like cr creationism, um, ver like intelligent design versus, uh, the evolutionary thing. And they th they have this one, um, exhibit where they have two scientists that are looking at the same set of evidence, right? Like it's like a fossil. And then it's like on one hand, like it, it, you know, you have this one scientist that is coming from a, this perspective and he sees like he interprets data a certain way. And then on the other hand, you have this other scientist who is interpreting data, looking at the same exact evidence, but interpreting it from a different worldview, so to speak, or whatever. And, or, you know, a similar kind of example would be like two investigators that are investigating a homicide. And, you know, one of them's like, okay, so there was one killer. He came in through the window. He used this, you know, night, this, you know, table leg or whatever. And the other guy, the other investigator is like, no, 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 no. There were two killers. They came in the front door and they have these conflicting theories because sometimes like things can come down to how you uh, interpret evidence in essence. And so when you have like these historical things that you're talking about that are kind of, uh, I don't know, conspirator or corruption in essence and possible con collusion, then obviously that can make for people, it makes for people that once you create even a little bit of distrust, it's easy to make these jumps to other things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's all down to like, not only just, um, the perceptions and preconceptions of, of the people, but also just the way the evidence is presented. I um, mean, you talk about investigators. Now, really, uh, the focus of an investigator should be on on solving the crime, uh, figuring out who did a certain thing. But you know, something you see if you you watch like crime dramas and uh, true crime is that often investigators will have a bias, and sometimes there's a an imperative uh, within the police to to close the case and just pin it on somebody so that they can say that they, they've closed the case. Now, you know, obviously that doesn't, doesn't happen with the, the majority of cases, but sometimes it does. And uh, it, it could be even a, a subconscious thing. Like they, they have a suspect and they think that they did it. And then instead of trying to neutrally uh, investigate the topic, then they're trying to figure out how can I pin it on this guy? I know this guy did it. I, you know, he's, he looks guilty to me. I know he might, I think he's the guy who did it. You know, what evidence can I find that proves that when you should really be, uh, trying to neutrally look at, you know, did he do it and try to find evidence that he didn't do it? How can I disprove it? How can I eliminate this guy? Um, and it, people kind of make this, this shift in a way from acting as investigators to acting as advocates. Uh, essentially, they're taking the, the role of the lawyers arguing a case rather than a, a neutral investigator. And if you become an advocate for a position, it's fairly easy to make a compelling case if you suddenly think all I'm going to do now is figure out the arguments in favor of this one thing and I'm not going to talk about anything else because I know it to be true. So that you get these people who are, are deeply religious who believe in creationism, they, they feel they know it to be true. It must be true because it's in the Bible and you know, their, their religious teaching has taught them this. And so they don't feel any need at all to investigate. The only need they feel is to demonstrate that it's actually true. And so they only look uh, for this other these, these pieces of evidence. And you could argue, kind of like this Creation Museum did, that uh, evolutionary scientists have a, have a similar kind of, of bias uh, in that they, they, they strongly believe that, uh, that evolution is responsible for, for these fossils. And so they look at it in that framework. But of course, then you've got to look at what is the actual you know, body of evidence that supports one and the body of evidence that supports the other. And then if you're really going to get down to it, you don't want to just be trusting the word of one guy or another. You want to look at all the evidence and then it starts to get complicated. Um, and, that is, and that complication is how uh, the, the, the complication is what allows these things to get going, because people don't actually understand a lot of what's going on in the world. And so they rely on other people telling them what to believe. And a lot of times that ends up being wrong. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I'm not an expert in science, but f you know, fortunately for me, like when it comes to certain things like this, I got my bat background is in mathematics. Like that was what my degree is in, in university. So there are certain things like numbers and stuff like that, that makes sense to me. Or when I'm reading scientific things, the connections are easy, but 
on top of it, like, first of all, you can go into like, cause I was, you know, I'm, li- I'm reading your book and for the listeners, like escaping the rabbit hole, part of the, part of the point of the book was kind of almost like a, it was like a manual for people who are, who talk to people that are deep into these conspiracy theory rabbit holes and how to talk to these people about, look, let me kind of explain to you why this doesn't make sense or whatever, and, and how to properly approach somebody like that. I'm, I'm probably not doing the book justice, but uh, and I'll let you correct me when I'm done talking, but, uh, the, you know, when you were going down through like the, um, the, some of the nine 11 conspiracy theories and, and, you know, everything from, I don't know, the, like the, the temperature at which jet fuel, uh, ignites and the, the, uh, the melting point of steel and all these different kinds of things. Like if you don't have a, if you don't have a background in science, a lot of these things are not going to make sense to you. But on top of that, even if you do, like when it comes to things like this, like people just don't have the time to really dig, really dig deep into a particular topic. And so it's easy to, to make a jump into something like that because, you know, even if you are an educated person, it's, you know, it only takes certain things to, you know, yeah, kind no, of it, it is like make sense. people don't have the time and they don't have the capabilities. I mean, you, you know, you've got a degree in mathematics, so you, you have a pretty deep understanding of, of mathematics, but you don't necessarily understand everything about material science. Uh, and then someone comes along and says, look at the, the, the crystal granular structure of this piece of an I beam flange that indicates it's uh, undergone an, a euteric reaction that must mean that uh, explosives were, lo- were used. I, you, you have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, most people don't. I, mean, I don't. I don't really, because it's not really my area of expertise. Uh, and so people you know, then start to defer to what they think of as being experts. And one of the most effective ways of promoting a theory is to get a group of experts on your side, and and then present these a large body sometimes of experts and say that these people who are experts believe this. Therefore, it must be true. So you, uh, with the 9-11 conspiracy theory, you've got this group called, excuse me, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, which is uh, an organization, I think it has something like 3,000 uh, members who have some kind of uh, engineering or architecture or some kind of science credential. Uh, and they've all signed on and said they think that the World Trade Center was destroyed by explosives because it looks funny to them. And because you now have this large body of people who are saying this, you get other people who are not experts and they say, well, you know, look at how many people, look at at all these architects and engineers who believe this. But if you then take that, I mean, it's very compelling, but what you've got to do is look at that in the broader context. How many people are there who actually fulfill the criteria that these 3000 people represent? And it turns out it's, it's tens of millions of people. And yet they've managed to find like 3,000 people who actually will say that they think it was controlled demolition. So it sounds like a lot, 3,000 scientists believe this. But if you take it as a percentage of the actual scientists, it's like 0.01% of scientists believe this. And that's really the reality. These positions are generally very, very, very fringe uh, positions. Like uh, the... The belief that global warming or climate change uh, has no man-made component isn't something that you'll actually find any climate scientists uh, agreeing to. You know, you've got this, this 97% consensus, but really it's pretty much 100% consensus there amongst uh, climate scientists. Uh, and yet because you can gather together uh, a petition of several thousand people who have some kind of degree in science of some sort, who say that they they doubt the uh, the consensus position on global warming? You can just point to that. Look, a thousand scientists say that, which sounds impressive, but really it isn't. Yeah, but you know, even within even within the consensus on the other side of that, because that that's going to make it difficult for people. Because once you have experts, like if you have architects and engineers that are saying that this that the the World Trade Center, for example, was an inside job due to whatever they're citing, whatever evidence they're citing. I mean, they know more than me, right? And so if these people are convinced, then the the logical jump would be like, okay, well, here's a group of people that are b- b- brave enough to be outspoken about it. How many of the 10 million or whatever that, you know, we talked about before are just, uh, you know, not, they don't have a position. They don't, they don't have a care on, on, on the matter or anything like that, you know? Because even, like, even if I believe that 9-11 was an inside job, 
okay, I can sit here and believe this, but at the end of the day, like, how does it change my life? How does it change my life if I could actually prove that it was an inside job? So I'm just like, no, it's not, that's not that important to me. People, if, 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 if it was an inside job and, and people, there are people in this world that had the power to do that, can I do anything to thwart that? Can I do anything to change this? So well, why even bother caring? I think it would uh, change your understanding of the world though. I think a lot of people want to kind of understand how the world works and uh, how power works within the world. And if you think it works one way, then I think your relationship with reality and your relationship with, with the world is going to be kind of different. And your whole attitude about um, like, you know, government, for example, is going to be very different. If you think that it's a, a secret cabal of, uh, of, you know, whatever with QAnon now, like, you know, child torturing pedophiles or something like that. Uh, and, you know, 10 years ago it, that it was this secret cabal of warmongers who, uh, who fabricated 9-11 using secret nanothermite. I think it does make a, a big change to the individual. Um, you know, maybe for a lot of people, they, they have this kind of um, implicit distrust of government anyway, and they might think, oh, well, you know, perhaps that's the type of thing that they would have done and they don't give it that much thought. But it's when you really get deep into it and you start formulating these, these really strong beliefs that these things actually happened, that a lot of people, it starts to take over their life, uh, that, that they, they believe in these things as being such important uh, parts of the world. You know, it's history being hidden, the true history of the world uh, exists and only they know what it is and uh, that there's this evil cabal running the world who could be stopped if just simply more people knew about this thing and so they become evangelical in terms of uh, promoting this idea so you know I'm sure for a lot of people like it's like yeah whatever you know maybe aliens exist maybe they don't what difference does it make yeah that's that's an understandable point of view because from a daily basis you know these things don't change anything but for some people, it can be a very, very significant part of their lives. Here, I'll ask you a question. I mean, you're, you're the you're the expert on this. So, so this is this is one piece of evidence on 9/11 that I've had, that I've really struggled with. Um, the the BBC report with uh, Jane Stanley on um, mm -hmm. World Trade Center Seven. You know, they reported on that building collapsing like 25 minutes before it actually went down. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I can't logically reason how that would have happened considering even if they knew that the the building was structurally impaired, they would have been reporting on the speculation of that and the evacuation of the people inside and all the different kinds of things that would have gone on had yeah. they had they known. And so how how is it that, a, that something like that can happen without foreknowledge well, of something like that? They, they uh, I think... You got to remember just how chaotic the day was. It was a completely unexpected situation, uh, obviously. Uh, hugely chaotic ground situation with reporters being being there and uh, trying to figure things out or interviewing firemen and things like that. And uh, there was a degree of foreknowledge, you could call it foreknowledge, that the building was going to collapse because there were people saying this, this is going to collapse. There was, was a famous shot of one fireman uh, who say, oh, it's going to come down. There's no way it can't come down because he'd been up close to it and he'd seen the the fire and the the big gouge out of the the south side and the fact that it was making all these weird creaking noises uh, and that it, you know sometimes the buildings look like they're leaning when they're when they're not. But you know you might have thought that it was going to collapse. But yeah, everyone's there and they've seen the twin towers already collapse, which is the most uh, incredible, mind blowing thing you can imagine. And the idea that this other smaller building might collapse isn't really that amazing. But again, that stopped firefighting uh, on the building hours earlier because of concerns that it might collapse. There were people who said it was going to collapse because they were you know, expecting it to collapse because of the fire. And that gets to the news organizations. Uh, there are reports that uh, the Solomon building, which is what they called it, is going to collapse. And so, uh, well, let's talk about that. And so they, they call up the newsroom and say, yeah, the Solomon building is going to collapse. And so they said, oh, well, let's tell, uh, let's tell Jane about that. And uh, hey, uh, the Solomon building has collapsed. Uh, what do you think about that? And she'd be like, oh, I heard that was going to collapse. Well, that's the first I've heard about it. But yes, that's obviously very whatever. So I think it's very easy for this the chain of information to be just slightly corrupted from it's going to collapse to it has collapsed it's not really a very significant thing in my mind and there's been she she 
did interviews later, like a couple of years later, kind of explaining what what was going on at the time, the chaos, and the fact that that was the first that she'd actually heard of it. Uh, when when she I mean, she wasn't reporting it, the, the guy actually told her that it collapsed and asked her uh, you know, about uh, it, and she had to kind of extemporize on the spot. So it, it really, to me, when you look at the whole picture, it doesn't seem that impressive. I, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, that's one of those where like, yeah, the, the steel beams, the, the detonation, like all, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard the counter, like I, I hear arguments mm -hmm. on both sides. Like, you know, I've gone down these ra rabbit holes. I've been down the rabbit hole on both sides of the arguments and, uh, you know, like the time it would take to put all the explosives in a building to bring it down and all that. Like, you know, it, obviously th these things make sense, but uh, for me personally, like that, the whole, that whole thing with the Jane Stanley interview was, was one that I've always kind of like scratched my head, like, mm, Oh, man, this is hey, tough. To me, it doesn't seem odd at all because you know people say things that are wrong on the air uh, all the time. Like you know, even even in highly scripted situations, people make mistakes. Uh, and you know, you, you could argue that on the one hand, what you're what you're claiming as a say as a conspiracy theorist, if you were a conspiracy theorist, you're claiming that she made a mistake and read the script too early. And so that means that you're saying that she's capable of making mistakes of a very significant nature because it would be like a huge thing to let the cat out of the bag early. So you're saying on the one hand that she made a mistake and yet you're also simultaneously denying that it's possible for her to make a mistake. So you know that doesn't really work because if she can make a mistake, then she could have made a mistake. And the, the simplest explanation is that it was just a simple mistake of saying that it had collapsed when she was supposed to say, uh, well, she, the, the, the real information that the guy should have given her, which is the reality because he was standing there right behind her, uh, was that people thought it was going to collapse. And it's a very simple mistake to go from one to the other. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, all right. Um, I see you're not convinced. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not unconvinced. Like it's one of those things that falls in. Like, I'm just kind of like, mm, I don't know. I'd have to go back and rewatch the news report. I'd have to watch the, like, right. you know, cause I'd start like keying into like body language and start and assessing all that as well. Um, but it's, it's not yeah, even one yeah. of those things. I like, I haven't, I haven't seen that video in a long time, but I just remember that when I was going down that, that rabbit hole of like reading about this stuff, because, you know, it doesn't matter what happens. Like, um, you, know, you, you know, in your book, you talked about the Sandy Hook school shootings or chemtrails or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Like you know, a lot of different conspiracy theories. And, you know, so anytime a piece of news like that comes out, like I will like I'll look at uh, at, at both sides. You know, I mean, even with yeah. the uh, with the, the like even a more recent case of like um, uh, George Floyd, what, what happened last year with George Floyd. And there, there are a lot of people that don't believe that he's dead. You know, um, I, really? I think there's a lot of people that believe he's probably like chilling with Tupac and Elvis or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there's a, there are a lot yeah. of, a lot of people that believe that that was uh, a completely staged event. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's like the storming of the Capitol. People, uh, claimed at the time that it was, it was a staged event by Antifa or whatever. And some people still claim that. Uh, because it's it's uh, it fits the worldview better. There are certain things for me though, like when I think about people like storming the Capitol, I'm like, how the heck can you storm the Capitol? Do you know, like it's just like I'm scratching my head, like how is this even possible? Like I, I mean, I've been to the Capitol building, I've been to the White House, and just I mean, the White House, for example, has like the the defense system at the White House, the number of snipers they have on the roof. Like I don't even think you would get three feet past the gate without getting shot. For example, well, they have like eight snipers on the roof max, I think. So uh, if you have a, a, a horde of 10,000 people descending on the White House, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, but they, no one was shooting, obviously, at the time, uh, because you know, that would have been a terrible escalation of, of, of violence that everybody w wanted to avoid. Yeah, and unnecessary. And one woman got shot when she, she actually got into a region where the, the lawmakers were actually in that corridor right behind her, and uh, she got shot because she was you know, the, the, the vanguard of, of a group of people who might have rushed in. But you know, generally, it, it wasn't. Um, you know, no no lethal force was used other than that, really. Uh, but you know, obviously, you, you, it could have been far worse. But say uh, the Capitol Police started shooting, and uh, the protesters, probably a lot of them, had guns. You know, so some of them would have had guns, even though it was illegal to carry them. Uh, there, you know, they were all very uh, libertarian people who liked to carry their guns. And some people did have guns. They were arrested for having them. So it could have could have ended up a lot worse. But you know, how did it happen? It, it was just kind of a um, 
it was it was a failure of security. They didn't anticipate that people would do that, and uh, yeah, with hindsight, you can see that the mistakes that were made, and you know, calling the national guard should have been on call and should have been able to get there within 20 minutes but there was also there was consideration of the optics you, you hear about the, the the messages that were exchanged people were saying like you know send the national guard and other people oh we don't want to send the national guard that looks bad like let me let me just check with with somebody else and meanwhile everybody's uh, running through the through the chamber but again it's a chaotic situation uh yeah it's, it's hard for uh people to to you know Put yourselves in the in the in the in the shoes of someone who has to make these decisions uh, based on limited information. You know, the head of the National Guard was he glued to the TV watching everything unfold in the same way that you know perhaps you and I were. Uh, you know, probably not. So it's it takes him uh, some time response to get up time to speed. exactly. Yeah. No, yeah, just no. But when I sit and think about, it, I'm like, man, it's just I'm like the capital, like how, how, like how is this even possible? Not in a conspiratorial kind of way, like it was an inside mm -hmm. job, but just you know, I, I can't, I can't get through an airport without doing half of a striptease, right? And you yeah. know, like the security measures, and so like how the security measures were not in place for something like that. Well, you, yeah, but you got to think, think about that though, like the air plane uh, situation you've got these choke points uh where you've got to get through uh but airports are not designed to withstand being stormed by ten thousand people if you had ten thousand people trying to get into jfk airport they would get in uh, it's, uh, otherwise you might have that you know the scene from sparta where you've got like a bunch of guys holding off the the horde of the pass by by killing them all but yeah, that was something that, that wasn't really going to happen. So you you had the the Capitol Police progressively withdrew back, and uh, the security measures were crap. Like you could smash a window and get in. That that is something that shouldn't have been able to happen. And there should have been interior security doors, which had been suggested for years that there there'd be these lockable security doors inside, but. Uh, they weren't able to do it because it was a historic building and there was uh, there was reluctance amongst the, the members of Congress and the Senate to, to do that to the building because it would have required damaging 100-year-old doors. So it's just an unfortunate thing that it required this kind of wake-up call that security was, in fact, not very good. Yeah, that's but that's what I'm saying, though. You know, it takes, for example, you know, you're looking at, you're looking at a situation like 9-11 or something like that. I remember... Pre 9-11, I remember saying this to um, a friend a friend of mine. I, I said, you know, like if I was on a plane with two of my buddies, like two guys that were capable in hand-to-hand -hand combat at, at a level of which I'm capable, and they, the three of us could probably just take an entire plane, you know, because all you have to do is just incite fear, you know, grab that, I don't know, grab the, the pregnant lady in a row and make an example out of her and then uh, and then move on. And once you've instilled fear in the entire fuselage, then you, it's, you know, storming because they didn't have the locks on the doors for the uh, cockpits at that point in time. So and I remember saying that to somebody and it was like shortly thereafter, 9-11 happened. And, and surely I, I, I can't be the only person that would have thought of something like that. Like there had to be. I don't know, predictive models or what, you know, scenarios that had been thought yeah, out. There, there were, there were, I mean, people had actually uh, theorized similar things. There was actually, I think there was a movie made uh, that had people hijacking a plane and flying it into a building and it had been considered, but it's, you know, it's one of those things it has to make its way through to, to the mainstream. It has to be a legislation. It's, it's not like just some guy in a room could say, Oh, this looks like a, you know, a thing and we, we should flip a button and, install of these things it's it's like you have to make the case and uh yeah that the airlines have to spend this millions of dollars and we have to impose this this strict security on 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 people uh but yeah like you know back then uh hijackings were you know not not, not super common but you know every year or so a big plane would get hijacked and what would happen is the hijackers would have the plane fly somewhere and uh, they would demand various things and then either like something would happen the plane would get stormed or the the hijackers would would get off and sometimes get away uh but that was the expectation of what would happen if someone hijacked a plane is that they would ask to fly it somewhere and so the pilots were trained not to fight uh the hijackers because if you're fighting someone in that tiny little cockpit yeah the plane's probably going to go down because you'd be bashing everything around all the controls 
so you know that was that was the plan and then everything changed you know just just like you know everything changes every time there's a major event you learn from these major events and uh life incorporates the knowledge of of what just happened and uh and we move on in a new normal yeah still going back to the the capitol building though i just think that I, I get it with the hundred year old doors, but man, somebody should have been, like, especially looking at this modern world of the kind of things we've had to deal with, like the shootings, yeah. the shootings in Las Vegas, school shootings, you know, I mean, if it's that easy to breach the Capitol building, then it wouldn't have taken 10,000 people, know. you know, uh, yeah. could have taken a dozen people that were armed to breach yeah. the Capitol building. Yeah. It's like you get 10 guys with, with AKs, like, uh, storming the, the building. I and mean, it's quite plausible it's that that kind of happened to a hotel in India, like, uh, you know, like five, 10 years ago. Uh, it was just, I think four guys got into this big hotel. It had some security, sure. But then they went around shooting people. Uh, just, it would have been quite easy to do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a big concern, but I think people get kind of lulled into a sense of complacency. Uh, after many, many years and nothing happened. I mean, no one stormed the Capitol before. It's, it's hardly ever had any real threats. Uh, like, I mean, maybe some crazy guy tries to ram his car into it, but yeah, that's that's about all. You know, someone tries to climb the fence of the White House, just individual crazy people. Uh, and there's there's never been this, this significant threat uh, before. And, and this wasn't, you know, in a way that it might have, it might have gone very badly. Had they captured some some lawmakers, but it, it, it didn't really. It just ended up more like this kind of overly violent and destructive pro, uh, pro uh, protest rather than an actual uh, insurrection type thing. But uh, yeah, it's it, it was definitely a wake up call for the the Capitol Police and the Capitol Security. And there will be a report that will detail in in great depth what went wrong and recommendations uh, for. Going forward. I'm going to completely switch gears on this. Uh, <laughs> the, the, you should make a series of videos uh, debunking Simpsons predictions. <laughs> I, I mean, you, I'm sure you're well aware of this concept, uh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's you got to admit it's kind of eerie. Like some of the stuff that's on this show, where right. you're really scratching your head, like, wait a minute. Well, yeah. There's two things there. There's two things with the Simpsons predictions. Uh, there's two types of Simpsons predictions. One is where there's a coincidence where something in the show appears to predict something in the future. The second one is where the Simpsons do a show after the event that incorporates you know, things from it, like uh, Donald Trump coming down the escalator to announce his candidacy. And then people present it as being, hey, look, the Simpsons predicted this years ago. And it's these second ones actually that uh, seem to be the majority of what really freaks people out. They they think like, oh well, the Simpsons predicted Donald Trump being being president, and here's here's him coming down the escalator, which is exactly what happened. But that was something that they did afterwards. There was actually a very brief mention in one episode where where Lisa becomes president, uh, that where the previous president was Donald Trump. But that's just kind of like you know an, an obvious joke that Donald Trump might become president one day. Uh, so it's it's I think people make a lot more of it than uh, uh, than is, is warranted. But my, my wife and I have not exactly a game that we play, but uh, we we watch a TV show called Jeopardy here every night, which is a quiz show, and there's there's uh, sixty questions on it. Yeah, sixty questions, and pretty much every week, what will happen is something that appears on the show uh, is something that appears in real life. Uh, I can't remember the example from, from yesterday, but like once I asked, asked my, my wife, uh, what's for dinner? And she said, chicken and rice. And uh, I said, well, what's chicken and rice in Spanish? And she says, you know, pollo con rolls or whatever it is. Uh, and then later that same day, we were watching Jeopardy. And uh, one of the clues was the Spanish word for chicken and rice. And we were like, whoa, what? But the thing was, that type of thing happens every single day. Well, that's because you're psychic, though, remember? I'm going back to the beginning. Yeah, it's not because I'm psychic. It's just that I play Jeopardy every 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 day. <laughs> My wife does the crossword every day, and a crossword has like 50, 60 clues or so. So because, because you're getting so many different things, and there's so many things in the world, you got these like Venn diagrams, huge amount of things here, huge amount of things here. There's going to be some overlap from time to time. And that's you, what happens with The Simpsons. The Simpsons has 
what, 20 plus years of episodes, thousands and thousands of episodes, tens of thousands of things happening in those episodes. If you go back and watch them all, you'll find things that appear to resonate with things that happen in the future. Yeah. It's just a lot of things sometimes, you know, I, like, I, I've, I've never, I've never done a deep dive. Vi- I've never done it like a deep dive research on this, but I've seen like video compilations and, and it's enough to make you go. Hmm. That's the thing. That's how they get you. Yeah, they no, get no, you, no, no. They, they, there's this like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of things in the Simpsons. And some of them, I say about 20 of them look like really good predictions of what happens in the future. But if you take a hundred thousand things and you just, pick the ones that look good. It's what's called the the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, which is where a guy claims to be a really good shot with his six shooter and he he, he goes up to a barn and he shoots the barn six times. um, And then he goes up to it and he he paints, paints a bullseye around the best three shots and says, look at this cluster I got right in the bullseye. But it's just selection. It's a cherry picking. If you pick uh, 20 things out of 100,000, you just pick and pick the best ones. That's all that happens. Uh, on this this concept uh, with the, the chicken and rice, have you seen have you seen the number 23 Jim Carrey movie? All the time, dude. Yeah. It's everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what that's what the movie's about. You know, it's, again, it's one of those things like uh, I, I often notice I look at my clock and it's 314. I'm like, dude, that's pi 3.14. Yeah, what what are the odds of me looking at the clock and it's three point one four? Yeah, I look at the clock all the time and it's 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 some particular number, uh, the same time uh, throughout the year. If you if you get, well, it's it's called priming. If you bet your brain gets primed to look for something, it gets really good at at finding it. Uh, and you can do this yourself. You know, if you if you I don't know if you do this, but if you're looking for something, like you say, I had lost my particular like electrician screwdriver. Uh, you have to have a picture of it in your mind whilst you're looking for it. And you think, all right, it's black with a yellow bit on it. Like, where is it? Where is it? Black with yellow, black with yellow. And you're looking around because your brain has to be primed to look for things. And if you become obsessed with something, like you think, oh, the number 23 is the secret message the Illuminati is sending out to everybody, then every single time you see 23, you're going to think it's significant. But if you were to spend like a week tallying every single number that you saw, you're not going to see more 23s than any other number yeah, based on where it is in the in the uh, uh, the number sequence. It's not a particularly significant number. It's no real, it's less significant than 24. You're going to see a lot more 24s. 24 just being a nice round number. Things come in, in sets of two dozen. You'll see it a lot less than 20 because 20 is a nice round number. You see a lot less than 25. You'll probably see a lot less than 21 because people like to talk about you know the 21st you know, when people come of age, the 21st part, party and things like that, 23 is a pretty boring number. It's but prime. if you instill it with significance, then every time you see it, it's like, boom, 23, ooh, 23. Yeah, it's a, it's a prime number. That's the only unique thing I can come up with for 23. Yeah, and uh, pretty boring, really. <laughs> I, I had a, a book called The Dictionary of Interesting Numbers. I'm not sure if I still have it, but... Uh, well, hold on. What would possess what, would, what possesses somebody to buy a book called The Dictionary of Interesting Numbers? Well, I used to be obsessed with dictionaries when I was younger, and uh, I, was, I like numbers, and I, I looked through it, and it starts out with zero. I think actually, I think it starts out with the negative numbers, but you know, zip then goes to zero. You know, you're a math guy; you would you would appreciate this type. Of I thing. actually and probably you know, like, I, I probably would appreciate this book, which is weird. Me asking you this question, like, yeah. what would possess somebody <laughs> to buy this book? As you as 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 I've asked that question and con- and continue listening to you talk about it, I'm like. This is actually yeah. pretty interesting. So go ahead. It's fun. Like, and it, it tells you about numbers like zero. And then it, it tells you about the history of zero and how you know, early civilizations didn't have a, a yeah. concept of a, a number for zero. Yeah, there's uh, no Roman when, numeral for zero. Yeah. And then the, the, obviously the, the evolution of the decimal system when you can use zero. Early uh, decimal systems didn't have a zero. They, they used a blank space. Uh, they would still do like long division in the same way or long multiplication. Uh, and they wouldn't use zero. They would have a blank space and they would have the numbers for uh, one through nine, the digits. Uh, uh, but they, they quickly discovered it was, it was a lot, you, if you draw a circle around that blank space, then it showed you where it was and it was less, you're less likely to make a mistake. And that's you know, partly how the, the idea of the, the, the zero digit itself came out. And then you, know, you go to like... Um, uh, I, the square root of minus one, and uh, pi, very interesting number, uh, E, natural logarithm base. Uh, and then they go through like yeah, two, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, you know, which ones are prime, which ones are pyramidical. And, uh, 
uh, which ones you, you can, uh, the first number, that's the factor of three prime, prime numbers, things like that. And then I think it, it came to one number. I can't remember where it was, but I think it might've been like 34 or something like that. And you know, 34 was significant because it's the first number that's boring and you can't say anything interesting about. <laughs> but it, from one to 33, there's interesting things about, because you just said that 23, they're all, they're all, you said 23 was boring that's, that's number. So you, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a prime number. It might be, I don't know, like, uh, is it a mersenne prime? No, it's not a mersenne prime, is it? It's uh, 31 is a mersenne prime. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting be, just because I, I, it got some kind of yeah symbolical uh, number like yeah, six 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 is is an interesting number uh, because it's the, the mark of the beast, but it's not a number that comes up very often. You see it on houses occasionally. Uh, that I live on like the eight hundred block here, and I think of the six hundred block down the road. There is actually is there a house that's six six? It's probably not. They, they, t they tend to not give houses the six 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 number. Yeah, it's like uh, skipping skipping the thirteenth floor on a on a building or. Uh, I think here in Asia, yeah, the yeah. number is four. I think they skipped the fourth, the number four over here, I believe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And another number's like in Asia. I think the number seven is considered to be like a lucky number. No, it's uh, uh, eight. In, in some, eight, 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 eight. Eight. Okay. Eight. Right. Yeah. So they, they, they like to use that in their phone numbers and their number plates and things, and they'll pay lots of money for it. Like numbers take on significance for reasons uh, that aren't necessarily based on like, you know, rational thought. Uh, sometimes it's superstition and sometimes it's, it's tradition and the, the 23 thing just kind of took on a life of its own and to a degree it's like you know movies like that 23 uh and uh conspiracy theory i think mentioned it as well the, the movie conspiracy theory with mel gibson uh promotes these things even though they're, they're fictional things and people start start believing it more just because it was on uh some movie oftentimes i don't like i don't like watching movies that are based on true events yeah you know, th those movies, like you can watch a movie, I mean, any any movie on any historical thing, like, I don't know, you know conspiracy theory, uh, going to the moon, Apollo 13. We watch the. Mm -hmm. I think there's a movie out on Netflix JFK. right now. First Man. Yeah, JFK. And so you, you, you watch a movie like that and then it's based on true events, but it's like, well, how much of that is actually really, really true? Not that it matters because it's a movie, but what ends up happening is when you try to recollect the historic, the history of something like that, your memory yeah. is going to go to the visual of that movie more so than it would yeah. any book that you read or, or anything like that for that matter. Totally. And that was huge with JFK specifically. Uh, the JFK movie by Oliver Stone uh, promoted a lot of this kind of simplistic bits of evidence. Yeah, it came uh, out. That, they, that movie they, came out they, like 91, 92 or something. It was right before yeah, I graduated. Yeah, something like that. It's pretty old, but uh, yeah, people watch it and it's a compelling movie. It's, it's almost like they're, they're trying to make the case. And there's, there's bits of evidence in there that, you know, were debunked many, many years before the movie was made. Like there's the, the thing about the, the magic bullet having to turn in midair and change direction. You know, that was something that was, it's just, it's just a nonsensical thing that's based on a misunderstanding of where the people were sitting in the car. Uh, and yet people to this day will still cite the magic bullet having to change direction in midair as being a piece of evidence because they saw it in a very compelling form in this movie. So these movies, these movies have a, have a huge effect. I don't see the number 23 very often. I'm going to say that much. So, but I probably will avoiding you. Yeah. I, I will, I will probably end up buying the uh, dictionary of interesting numbers, even though I kind of semi made fun of you with that question, uh, <laughs> you know, in a sarcastic kind of way, but yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, I wish I had it uh, on my shelf here, but, uh, uh it's hidden, hidden away somewhere. I've got to ask you, have you ever listened to anything that Alex Jones has said and been like, I agree with that? Well, sure. That's the thing with Alex Jones is that he uses truth as a vehicle to promote nonsense. You can say things that are true very easily. And, you know, if you've got a multi-hour long podcast, it's, it's difficult to avoid saying things that are true. Uh, you could talk about issues with America's foreign policy, like how it's uh, rather overly interventionist. You know, what are all these American troops doing in Africa right now? Uh, you know, people don't know just how many uh, kind of covert actions the U.S. military is involved in under the guise of uh, fighting radical Islam. Uh, but what's actually going on there? It's kind of uh, unknown what's, what's happening. You know, what's going on with, with mass surveillance? Uh, there's, there's issues there. Uh, so you know, he he raises points 
in a context of kind of distrusting the government, which it, to, to some degree is valid. We should distrust the government. We should hold them to account. Uh, we should try to figure out what's going on. Uh, but he then uses that to kind of uh, piggyback onto more extreme things. And that's where it kind of goes south, where he starts saying things like Sandy Hook never happened or uh, the Twin Towers were brought down by explosives. Uh, I think he even like talked about chemtrails for a while and he's, he's backed off from that. Uh, but yeah, you in any, any documentary, if you can use facts, verifiable facts as a foundation, it makes it seem like your more extreme claims are are true because you've kind of surrounded them with all these things that are true. Uh, but so, of course, you hear him say things that are true. Yeah, you know, you talk about distrusting the government. It's one of, one of those things. I'm I'm not like I'm not, I'm not a very trusting person. I think most people in this world aren't aren't really trusting people. That's why you lock your doors at night, for example. I think most people in the world are fairly trustworthy. But, you know, it only takes one bad apple here and there, which is like, you know, you talk about like corruption. It doesn't, you know, it only takes one person in a position of some power to be corrupt, to create a lot of havoc in, in the world, in essence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, and that's why, why uh, government checks and balances are, are very important uh, and the type of thing that we should encourage. Uh like there, there is oversight within government. There's lots of investigations that go on into like how money was spent and things like that. So you get these, the general accounting office and you get the inspector general in the US government who are tasked specifically with, with investigating things that happen within government, make sure the money is spent uh, correctly. Of course, there's, there's a lot of room to maneuver. Um, like the Pentagon's budget is like nearly a trillion dollars. There's a lot of, of room to shift a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there, uh, and and make things happen. Uh, but th there is oversight, and we should encourage more oversight and more rigorous oversight and more public oversight of of how our money is spent. Because you know it's, it's our money, it's our tax money, and it's been spent on things that we might necessarily agree with, or you know, it's obviously it will be spent on, spent on some things we don't agree with. But we should we should know where the money is going as much as is possible. Well, so, you know, that's what I say about government. It's it's the one entity in the world that you can't you can't opt out of. You know, for example, if you have a company and mm. you sell a product at your company, and I purchase your product, and you make a crap product, well, I can quit buying this. And people people don't understand the power that they have with their money to make decisions in this world. Like you can heavily influence things, and obviously this this. It can't, it can't be done on an individual basis, but in masses, um, you know, so for example, if your company makes a terrible product, like people are going to quit buying it and then that's going to sure. affect your, your, your profit margins and eventually your company will end up going out of business. And so that system, it's a natural system of checks and balances because you want to, you, you need to please the customer. The government is the only, like, governments are the only entities in this world where if, you don't like the product, for example, you can't like you can't opt out. You can't say, I don't want to buy your product anymore because you make a crap product. It's just one of those things where you have to take part no matter what. Yeah, yeah. It's uh uh it would be difficult to envisage a situation though where you get to pick and choose uh which which governments you 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 fall under. I mean, you would have to essentially have some kind of anarchical uh, mini states within the country that you could move around to it's not like changing your uh, your cell phone provider to a di to a different one no for sure you don't like uh, the service i'm not proposing uh, a solution to this because i don't have one no, but no, i'm saying a, i don't like old problem yeah i just don't i yeah. don't like that i don't like the uh the actual setup because there you know there is no system of yeah. checks and balances there well you can leave the country which, uh, no, but either way, <laughs> but you, once you leave the country, you're going to go to a different a different government, and you're going to you're going to run right. into the same problems yeah. everywhere you go, and that's yeah. that's my whole point, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, same, but same but different. Yeah, but it's but yeah. it's uh but it's it's left it's left unchecked. Unlike I mean, this is what I like about uh about a, a, one thing I do like about a capitalistic society is that when you you know when you create a, a business. Um, you know, your, your job is to, I mean, you're, you plan on putting out the best possible service or the best possible product you can so that you, yeah. you know, continue whatever, uh, being profitable. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's great. Uh, I think, you know, competition is, uh, one of the major driving forces of innovation, making uh, improvements in things like that. And if we just had government computers, uh, then, you know, 
computers wouldn't have progressed very far at all. Uh, but you know, obviously, I think it's it's one of these age old uh, problems. Like, what is the best system of government? And it's not something for which there is an easy answer. And it's something where you can have people with different opinions. And you, what we end up with is, is a compromise. And that's why we kind of end up with these multi-party systems kind of hovering around the center uh, is that we are just arguing about a compromise. We're not getting to a solution. You know, a solution would be a, a dictator essentially, because that's the only way you can, you can get yeah, everything done. Uh, so it's, it's endless compromise is basically what's going to be in the future uh, for pretty much the foreseeable future. UFOs, you believe in them at all? Because uh, you cause you, de you debunk a lot of them. You know, because I'm asking you this because uh, I, like on Metabunk, there's a lot of debunking of of the UFOs. So I don't know if you're just debunking those individual, like each individual video, or are you just because like the Pentagon's release statements, the government's release statements at this point in time that they they do exist and kind of and well, yeah, the, the, they haven't really. The the Pentagon has released statements that certain videos are real videos. But I mean that's pretty much as far as it goes, that the, the, they say this video was a video that a Navy pilot shot and it showed something that was unidentified at the time. Uh, so yeah, there was an unidentified flying object. It doesn't mean that it was an alien spaceship. It could mean it could just be something like uh, an unidentified Russian MiG fighter that's uh, got a little bit too close to our airspace, or it could be an unidentified drone or it could be an unidentified uh, aerial phenomenon, like some kind of weird cloud or something like that. Uh, the, there's, there's obviously real UFOs, not real UFOs, there are UFOs as a concept are real uh, because there are things in the sky that are unidentified. You know, the question is really, the interesting question is, what do you think, uh, do you think there is an advanced technology of some sort behind these UFOs? Is there some kind of anti-gravity or, or warp drive that's been developed by humans or possibly even by, by visiting aliens? And I, I think that the evidence for that question really isn't, isn't in. Uh, there's lots of kind of suggestive evidence. There's lots of radar things where the thing goes from, pew, pew, from here to here in a, a time that seems impossibly fast. Uh, there's eyewitness accounts of things happening. And there's some very, very blurry photos and video. But there isn't really evidence that for me is compelling enough to say there's something amazing going on well i'll just say this uh i'll leave you with this thought if tomorrow you and your wife are watching jeopardy and a the the answer is what is the rendition force incident um mm -hmm. that's probably a sign <laughs> that you should look into this thing all righty well yeah. we'll see yeah because we'll I've, I've now primed your brain so it's going to come up on jeopardy yeah. something something related yeah. to this something will there'll be some yeah. ufo thing will come up in the next next week of jeopardy awesome well hey mick i appreciate the uh the conversation i'd had, had a really good time chatting with you so all righty how can people get a hold of you where, where can they find you uh they can follow me on twitter at mick west or they can go to mickwest.com or metabunk.org all right mick thanks a lot man for coming on i really appreciate all right. it yeah good chatting with you Quite Franklin is providing this podcast as a public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor legal advice, nor a statement of Quite Franklin policy. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation of that product or entity by Rich Franklin or Quite Franklin. The views expressed by guests on the podcast are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by Quite Franklin employees or representatives are the views and opinions of the persons expressing them, and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Quite Franklin or any of its officials or principals. Nothing heard on this podcast at any time is medical advice or is intended as medical advice. The listener must always consult his or her personal physician or other qualified medical professional regarding any questions of a medical nature. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact our general counsel.